So hello everyone, my name is Darian Beverungen and I am the Historic Sites Planner um, in the Cultural Resources section uh, for the county I'm in the Office of Planning and Zoning. And co-presenting with me today is Richard Streiner, who's here with me. Um, Richard is a retired professor of history from Washington College. Um, he is a historian and preservation advocate who has worked in saving many historic buildings over the years. Um, and he's hoping to get involved in preservation projects um, here in Anne Arundel County. So I'm uh, very happy that he could be here with me today um, to talk about historic general stores. And I'm going to share my screen now for my presentation. everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So about a year or so ago, Rick contacted me about an old general store building in Severna Park that I knew nothing about or that it even existed. And he said that he um, was assisting the owners in their plans to restore the building and bring it back to life as a commercial property and was interested in having it listed on the county's inventory of historic resources. And Rick's gonna talk later about the Corwell store and, and the project that he's been working on with the owners, but this caught my interest um, because over the years that I've worked here, I've come across other general store buildings in various communities across the county. Some are listed on the inventory already and some are not. Some have been repurposed and others are in a dilapidated state, but all were significant resources in the communities they served and are wonderful, wonderful examples of vernacular architecture and are a piece of Americana that have nearly disappeared from the cultural landscape. Um, so this is where sort of I got the idea for this presentation. And I, I'd like to preface this though, first by saying that, uh, this is not representative of every general store there ever was in the county or that may still exist, but it's just um, a snapshot of some of the stores that I've come across in my own research and survey work over the years. From the colonial period through the 19th century and up to World War II, Anne Arundel County remained a rural and agricultural community. Outside of Annapolis, only small towns or crossroad villages developed. Rural general stores met both an important commercial and social need in isolated areas. They were the third place, if you will, for many people. And the third place is the idea um, that it is someplace that is integral in someone's life next to home and work. Besides being a source of goods, general stores provided a social need as well. They were places where people could gather to socialize or conduct business, and oftentimes storekeepers were more than just that. They could also be postmasters, undertakers, or serve as the justice of the peace, for example. And I kind of liken American general stores to British pubs. Uh, there was one in nearly every community and was the heart and social center of that community. Um, and here you can see men playing cards in the walkie store in friendship, well, I, which I will um, discuss again a little, little later on. One of the county's historic rural crossroad villages is Owensville. The first store opened in 1809 at the intersection of Sudley and Owensville Road. And in 1814, that intersection was selected as the location for the West River Post Office. By the mid 19th century, the village had two general stores. Now, at some point, one was closed and its last store operated for over 100 years, um, but sadly it was uh, closed and demolished in 1952. Davidsonville is another 19th century crossroads community located around the intersection of Central Avenue and Davidsonville Road. A general store has always stood at the southwest corner of the intersection since the 1830s. In the undated photo at the top, the store was then owned by Irving King. 
According to local history, the storekeeper lived in a small house on the opposite or southeast corner from the store. And the current building in the photo below dates from the early 20th century. Friendship, which is located in the southernmost part of the county, started to develop in the first quarter of the 19th century. And as you can see in this 1860 map, it emerged into a regional commercial and social center. Three stores are identified here. The oldest surviving building in Friendship is what is referred to as the Parsonage. It was built in 1806, and it housed the first store and post office in the village, and later served as the Parsonage for the neighboring Weems Chapel. In the 20th century, it became a tenant house, and today it is an antique store. The Walkie store was built around 1886 by either Henry Owens or his daughter, Ella Owens Walkie. Ella and her husband, Emil, operated the store until 1936. At that time, they sold it to their son, Emil Walkie Jr., and it stayed in the Walkie family until 1986. Presumably, this is Emil Jr. and his wife, Louise, in the store in the 1970s. The building was renovated in 1997 and has since housed various restaurants. Sudley too was a crossroads village that developed around the intersection of Sudley and Nutwell Sudley roads. The J. Crandall store is the last surviving building of this 19th century community. It served as both a store and post office from the mid 19th century until the early 20th century. The building stands today as a private residence. Like the Crandall store, it was very common that the general store also served as the local post office. And as I said, the store merchant was often the postmaster as well. These are some other examples of general store and post office combinations. In 1889, business partners Gustav Hetschel and Henry Frost established a general store and post office adjacent to the Annapolis and Baltimore Short Line in Early Heights. The combined general store and post office was a fixture along railroads, providing convenient services to not just the towns they were in, but also to commuters. A store operated here until 1943. The Millersville store and post office was established on July 24, 1841 by George Miller along the Annapolis and Elkridge Railroad in Millersville. He served as the first postmaster in the new town. The store and post office operated out of this house until the late 19th century when then owner Leonidas Cecil moved those operations out of the house and into a new building across Cecil Avenue from the residence. That building suffered from a fire and was rebuilt in the 1920s. It still stands across the street today and the business continued there until 1972. The Pendell station was located along the Chesapeake Beach Railroad in Bristol. The railroad ran from Washington, D.C. to Chesapeake Beach in Calvert County. The building pictured here served as a station, warehouse, store, and post office. After 1930, service was discontinued along the railroad and the community dissolved. Unfortunately, the building is no longer standing. Now, an unassuming building is the Johnson Store and Post Office in Pasadena on Mountain Road. It was built in the 1850s and served the community from about 1855 to 1872. It is believed to be the oldest commercial building in the area. The surrounding community was actually named Johnson's Store for a time until it became known as Jacobsville in 1872. In 2015, it sustained fire damage, but it is still standing and is vacant. And you can see it if you drive along Mountain Road today. As the crossroads of Central Maryland, Anne Arundel County had many towns that were established and grew up around the railroads. 
Harmons and Severn, for example, were established along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The village of Harmons actually was first established further west, but it relocated in close vicinity to the railroad tracks around 1872. The commercial area grew up along Old Dorsey Road and Old Colleen Road. Hezekiah Shipley built this combined residence and store in 1875. It eventually passed to Edwin Harmon in 1899, who was appointed postmaster of what was then called Harmon Station. A convenience store and post office operated in this building up until 1974 when the store ceased. The post office eventually closed too in 1990. In Linthicum Heights, Frederick Schweinsberg and Henry Balkanand opened the Shipley Heights grocery store in the 1920s on the ground floor of a house. It was located at the corner of Hammonds Ferry and Oak Grove Roads. Another store was owned by Charles and Viola Vanga, who moved to Linthicum Heights from Baltimore in 1923. Their house had a one-room store. In the bottom right photo, which was taken in the 1930s, the store was located next to the Esso station on Camp Mead Road. Built in the 1880s by William Shipley, the building in the top right photo was built to house a store, station, and dwelling. By 1910, Louise and Ida Garland ran the store out of the house. Though heavily altered from its original appearance, the building still stands next to the light rail tracks near the crossing on Camp Mead Road South. Perhaps one of the more successful railroad towns is Odenton. The oldest standing structure is the George Murray House, which was built in 1872. The rear wing accommodated Murray's general store. In addition, Murray and his wife, Rebecca, owned a hotel, which also housed a general store, restaurant, and ballroom. Today, the Murray House, which is located on Odenton Road, is a private residence. In 1928, William and Maisie Pumphrey built their home and store that also operated a post office. According to the Odenton Heritage Society, this building was an important social gathering place during the Depression, where residents interacted and discussed the latest news. Another store in the community was owned by Werner Reeve, who lived in and operated a store and gas station in this building. The store was originally located adjacent to Piney Orchard Parkway, but it was moved to its current location on the back lot in 2012. Now, some rural communities in the county had more than one general store. A local store was vital for these co communities prior to the automobile age when people could travel to Annapolis or further for their necessities. Galesville is just one of those rural communities. They had a number of general stores over the years, including Cobb's Store, later known as the West River Market. It was built by Emil Lurch, who was a German immigrant who migrated from Germany in the 1850s. When a post office was established in Galesville, Lurch became the postmaster. In 1897, John Cobb became Galesville's postmaster and by 1906, he owned the store. John Cobb Jr. eventually took over the store from his father. And this is a photo of him and his wife and their five children. The Cobb family continued to own and operate the store for much of the 20th century. It did not pass out of their ownership until the 1970s. Today, the store is owned by a nonprofit organization called Galesville Community Partners, Inc., which is composed of local Galesville residents. They are currently undertaking stabilization work on the building and plan to restore it to once again offer commercial uses for both residents and visitors. Another store in Galesville was the Leatherberry store, which was owned by Captain Harvey Leatherberry. He operated the store from 1904 to the 1960s. And since his ownership, the building has been used for various antique shops, which is its current function.
Lake Galesville, Deal is a rural waterman's community. Store owners here too relied on receiving goods to sell by waterway, most notably by the steamboat, the Emma Giles, which carried both passengers and goods to communities like Deal and Galesville. For such a small community, Deal had a number of them. The RT Phipps store was located on Deal Road, and this photo was taken around 1900. Captain Virgil Rogers store was located on Drum Point Road. Today, it is the location of Petey Green's restaurant. And according to Lois Nelwell's book, Rogers would sail to Baltimore to get supplies for his store or would go by horse and buggy to Chalk Point to pick up supplies from the Emma Giles. The store burned in 1946. Thomas Leach also owned a store which was located where Harrington Harbor Marina is today. The Windsor store was built in the early 20th century at the intersection of Deal and Drum Point Roads. It was owned by Captain Matt Windsor and his wife, Patty. That is them in the photo on the right. Later, the same building would occupy Henry's store, which you can see in this 1946 photo in the bottom left. One of the longest running stores in Deal was the Parks store. John Parks, a native of Deal, operated this store on Drum Point Road from 1914 until 1942. Like other merchants in these water communities, Parks was also a waterman. He would spend part of his day on the water and part running the store. He spent the rest of his life in Deal until his death in 1989 at the age of 105. Today, the building is a private residence, but it still looks much like it did when it was the store. Now, sadly, not all stores were open to everyone during the segregation era. African-American communities became self-sufficient by opening their own stores. One example is the Mount Zion or Ark Road community in Lothian. Pictured here is the Up Shop which was owned by Cornelia Brown Johnson Randall Cunningham. It served the community as a general store by day and a duke joint by night. Each day, a bell would be rung to let the community know that the duke joint was open. People would gather there to socialize, eat, and dance. The building has been extensively remodeled from this picture, but it now stands as a private residence. Corwell's store, however, was one store that did not segregate and was welcome to all. And at this point, I am going to turn the presentation over to Rick um, to tell you about the Corwell store and the restoration project. Good afternoon. Um, before talking about the Corwell's project and before I tell the story about how I got involved in it, I want to compliment Darian on the remarkable <laughs> research Thank you. Uh, that that she's performed here. It's been a joy to me to learn um, about uh, how many of the general stores uh, are are now uh, cataloged and and inventoried. We hope to find out uh, about more if we can. We suspect that there may be a great many more out there. So and yes, and on that note, I'll just say that after this presentation, if anyone. Um, knows of any others or wants to share a story, please, and we encourage you to do so because um, we would love to know where they were, who owned them, and, and their importance in, in your community or in others. So. Absolutely. We will take notes and follow up. Um, word or two about myself. I'm a historian. Um, I was a history professor for 30 years at Washington College across the Bay in Chestertown. Before that, I founded and led a nonprofit preservation group in, in greater Washington, D.C. And now that I've retired from being a professor, I've decided to get back into preservation uh, right here in Anne Arundel County, where I live. Uh, Pasadena is the place where my wife and I had settled down. And uh, toward the tail end of COVID, uh, one day I was driving down Baltimore Annapolis Boulevard and uh, decided to look um, 
in a more purposeful way at a building I had been dimly aware of for years, an old general store that had been boarded up and closed. And, and I was aware of it, but what caused me to, to take another look that day was the fact that I noticed that, that a 1932 Ford Model B pickup truck was in front of it. And it occurred to me that whoever uh, owned this building, uh, he or she clearly knew what they had. And that being the case, uh, it might be interesting to try to contact them, get to know them, and see whether they would be interested in, in attempting to restore their building. At that point, I knew nothing about the building's history. It did not take me long just, just talking around the vicinity to find out who owned it. And uh, that was how I made the acquaintance of a charming gentleman named Marty Reese. He and his wife, Mary, bought the store in 2004. They bought it to prevent it from being demolished. Talk about a historic preservationist dream, uh, a willing owner. Uh, in all of the casework that I had been involved in decades before, it was always a fight uh, against owners who wanted to demolish and clear the land and build something else. Not these people. Uh, they want to preserve the store, and they're very interested in restoring it. And so we began. Uh, and talking to Marty and his wife, who have lived in the area all their lives, I learned a lot quickly. I learned that the store, which uh, during all the years I'd known it, had a sign out front calling it Corwell's Country Store. The store had been known as Johnson's uh, through World War II. And Marty Reese, uh, through a little bit of phoning around, found one of the Johnson descendants, a very charming lady named Barbara Johnson Tourville, who consented to be interviewed. And she told me all about how Walter Johnson Sr. and his wife Rhoda built the place in 1927. I confirmed that by doing some research in land records down at the Maryland State Archives. They built it as a combination store and residence. And they ran it all through the Great Depression until the end of World War II. One of the interesting things about this phase of the store's history is that Walter Johnson and his half-brother, Tell Claude Johnson, uh, would drive down to Florida every summer to bring back tropical <laughs> goods, fruit, uh, luxury food items like that to Maryland. And eventually, they opened a sister store in Florida, in the town of Yulee, Florida. And they got to like Florida so much that at the end of World War II, they decided to relocate there and they put the store on the market, uh, whereupon uh, the next phase of the store's history began. Um, in Baltimore, a fellow named Jacob Wilson Corwell, who had come to the city seeking work in the Great Depression and who found work at a grocery store. Wilson Corwell was informed by his boss, a man named Clifford Dawson, who had just created a general store in the center of Severna Park, Jacob Wilson Horwell found out that there was an older country store for sale at the intersection of Baltimore Annapolis Boulevard and Early Heights Road. And so it was that the Corwells and the Johnsons connected. It was a handshake deal in 1945. The deed was transferred in 1947 and the place became Corwell's store. And so it remained right down to 2004 when Mary Corwell sold the building to Marty and Mary Reese. Uh, Corwell's, uh, well, Johnson's and Corwell's occupied a, a very important location at this particular place in Anne Arundel County. In 1927, when the store was built, Ritchie Highway had not been built. Ritchie Highway did not exist. Um, the most recent portion of Magathy Bridge Road did not exist. And so at this latitude, this was the most important north, south, east, west crossroads in this part of Anne Arundel County, below Mountain Road. And the store, as built in 1927, thus occupied a, a strategic location. And westward along Early Heights Road, 
uh, it connected to the railroad uh, that was served most directly by one of the stores that, that Darien surveyed, the Early Heights Frost Store in 1889. There were a number of general stores in the region. Um, there was the Corwell store, there was Listman's. Each served a clientele that uh, was uh, contiguous to the store's location, but the store owners knew each other, they cooperated, they helped each other. When one store became low on stock, uh, their friends in one of the other stores would, would lend them a bit to tide them over. It was a friendly place like that. And as Darian said, in particular, it was friendly across racial lines. Uh, Corwell's was a place where African-Americans and whites could meet on friendly terms and do business together during the Jim Crow era. And it was Marty who pointed this out to me. Marty, who put me in touch with uh, one of the principal uh, leaders of the African-American community in early highs to this day, a lady named Jean Creek, um, who consented to be interviewed. She told me that her mother, Eileen Hall Jennings, was a beautician who uh, ran her business out of her home, and Mary Corwell was her best customer. I believe on the screen now, uh, you see a triptych of, of images to the left. There's a shot of the interior of Johnson's from the 1930s showing Rhoda Johnson and, and just to her right, her son, Walter Jr. In the center is Mary Corwell, a very fetching lady. Uh, and to the right is Eileen Hall Jennings and her husband, Howard Jennings, picture taken of them in a local photographer studio, probably in the 1940s. And Jean Creek told me what a joy it was for her as a kid <clears throat> to come into Corwell's store and buy penny candy from Mary Corwell. Uh, she told me that she and her friends uh, would come in to bring in, perhaps some of you who are listening are old enough to remember, I am. <laughs> remember the days when uh, soda pop bottles um, were redeemable. Uh, in in cash, they were recycled, and Jean and her friends would walk up and down BNA Boulevard, collecting discarded pop, pop bottles, bring them in, and uh, Mary Corwell would very patiently count them up and then count out <laughs> the pennies that kids were to receive. Whereupon the kids would exchange the self same pennies for penny candy. It was uh, a very pleasant way to spend a better part of a summer afternoon. And many people dropped in uh, to spend time with Mary Corwell. It was a place where you could socialize. Uh, Diane Corwell Young, one of the mm -hmm. Corwell descendants told me that Mary, her mother was a woman who, I suppose like uh, good bartenders in pubs, was a person to whom you could tell your trouble. She was a good listener. Uh, people gravitated to Corwell's. Uh, Corwell's in the 1950s acquired a delivery truck. They had a cooperative arrangement with the Schram Farm for up um, BNA Boulevard. They did a, a big business in, in turkeys and pies around holiday time. Uh, I collected a wealth of information about the human side of Corwell's store. Now, what uh, we aim to do is to um, seek grant money to restore Corwell's. Um, the decision must be made at some point, will we try to backdate the building to the way it looked in 1927? If we can go back to that earlier image. This is the earliest photograph we have. Uh, Diane Corwell Young gave it to me, and my guess is that it was taken around 1945, the end of World War II, just when the Corwell's acquired it. Uh, this came to me from the Corwell collection. Um, if there are earlier images in the store, I haven't yet discovered them. So yeah. this is our uh, working image of the store as it probably appeared when Walter and Rhoda Johnson built it. If the decision is made to backdate it to this appearance, um, my advice to the Reese's is to go all the way. Put the SO sign back, they still have that, put some uh, 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 period gasoline pumps back, make the place look like it did in the late roaring 20s. Uh, it's an eye catcher right now. It's a bit of a local landmark, but, but made to look like this again, 
Oh, there would be nothing like it for miles around. Uh, it would draw business like a magnet, whatever business the rich decide to create. Their inclination is to make it a deli uh, or a country store or a small grocery store, some combination of, of the above. Um, they want to do the right thing by the place. And with a bit of luck and perseverance, we will be able to uh, carry this project through to success. It will be uh, a real asset, not just to Saverna Park and Pasadena, but to this uh, entire um, segment of, of Anne Arundel County. It will exist in a very nice relationship with uh, places like Kinder Farm Park, um, which uh, is a wonderful county owned park. Uh, the Kinder family, transferred the, the land to the county with the understanding that um, it would be maintained in a way that would teach what it was like to, to live on a farm, a family farm uh, of this type in the early 20th century. Um, Corwell store, though not contiguous with Kinder Farm Park, is close enough, generally speaking, to, to um, set up a theme that will be more and more valuable to the county as the years go by. That's probably uh, enough for now about this project. Wish us luck. Uh, now I'm going to turn the mic back to Darren. Yes. Well, and I just wanted to ask again, Rick. So as you can see, the photo here that we have up is the current photo. Yes. And when were that the string of windows that addition put on? Is that the an Corwell's, The Corwells renovated the building. They expanded it. Sometime in the 1950s, uh, based upon photographic documentation, um, we know that the transformation began in 1954. We just learned that, uh, but that it proceeded slowly, step by step. They uh, moved the entrance to the building uh, from the uh, front to the uh, left front side, where it currently is. Um, they built a ranch house uh, to the north of the store, which still exists. Um, the Corwells moved into that newly constructed house and moved out of the store building where they had been living, and then they converted the entire first floor of the store to commercial use. But they retained some bedrooms upstairs that they rented. Um, so this gradual change was phased in during the 1950s, and the store has remained in, in that general configuration uh, from those days to the present. And we will, as I say, have to determine whether to uh, restore, rehabilitate back to its altered 1950s appearance. It, it has that configuration right now. The restoration would consist of replacing damaged fabric with, with in-kind uh, reproduction, that sort of thing, or do a more ambitious intervention and, and backdate the appearance of the building to 1927. In terms of preservation philosophy, there's no, it's not that one option is the right and the other is the wrong one. There's a case to be made for either one. Um, both, uh, by my standards at least, are, are philosophically acceptable. Um, so it's up to the owners to decide which uh, treatment they would prefer. Once they have made that decision, uh, then we will apply for restoration funds. And just um, as a status too, so Corwell store was um, listed in the county's inventory of historic resources. Um, and, and Rick right now, he is pursuing a national register nomination um, for the store building, which I think is fabulous. We, we really don't have a lot of these 20th century vernacular structures on the national register. Um, so I, I think it would set a good precedence if we could get this one on, on the National Register and um, we'd be very supportive you know, of Every, that. Everyday buildings have tremendous importance. Uh, they were tremendously important to people's lives at the time they were created. They can and should be important for various reasons to people here and now. Uh, it's all a part of history and uh, historic preservation is a movement that seeks to uh, understand uh, and and make uh, constructive use of the evidence from our past 
in order to teach and in order to enhance our own lives. And buildings like this absolutely deserve to be recognized and preserved and, and used in an intelligent way that is consistent uh, with the, the meaning that they had, the meaning that they still should have. Um, stores like this, uh, as Darian pointed out, the, the multiple uses, they, they were places to buy and sell goods, they were places to get supplies, they were places to meet and socialize. And this is a, a story that goes far, far back in American history, all the way to, to the colonial period, uh, when frontier trading posts uh, began to, to uh, serve that kind of a function in, in brand new communities. Uh, this was the function of the general store where Abraham Lincoln was a clerk in New Salem, Illinois in the 1830s. Uh, it's a story that continues in one way or another down to the present, and especially after COVID, you know, we, we are putting a premium these days on places where you can get together and socialize with people in person. There, there's another big theme um, connected with these stores uh, in, in the way we buy and sell things, um, especially the way we go shopping. Uh, the idea of creating a place where you can get everything you need <laughs> at one location, as, as opposed to specialty shops set up by, by a, a tradesman specializing in a particular kind of good. Um, these general stores were part of a very broad movement that, that developed into many different kinds of uh, establishments not least of all by the mid 19th century, the department store, you know, urban done on a grand scale, same idea, mm -hmm. get everything you need at one location. And then in the 20th century, the shopping mall, shopping center, uh, single ownership, but multiple leases to multiple tenants with the idea that you create a good mixture so that people come to your destination with a, an ambitious list of things they want to acquire. And in our day and age, where do you go to buy anything you want at one location? You know the answer to that, don't you? It starts with an A, right? <laughs> Amazon, sure, it's all you know, online, but the, the, the old idea made new, whatever you want, we've got it. It's, it's an old story, a long story uh, that has evolved and changed over time. And stores like this, have a very interesting story to tell about their place in that history. Yes, well, thank you. So I'm gonna um, stop the screen sharing now, if I can. Can everyone see us again? Yeah. Oh, good, okay. Get this out of here. Okay, great. Well, yeah, so I'm curious if um, any one of you know of any other stores or have, um, you know, a story to tell from, you know, your childhood or, you know, anywhere that you've been um, more, more recently, if you know of any that still exists that, that we might not know about, I'd be interested to um, hear what you have to say. Does anyone want to talk? Um, I'd like to share something. My name is Sandy. I grew up in Baltimore. I grew up in Baltimore and on Sundays, my grandfather would pick us up in his Hupmobile and we would drive down to Jack's pharmacy. It was a pharmacy, but it also had an ice cream parlor and it was a meeting place for people on Sundays. You know, a lot of parents brought their children and, you know, we'd all sit at the counter and have, you know, banana splits while the, the guys talked about baseball, you know, the Orioles were playing or the Colts and the kids would be sitting there eating their ice cream. And it's still a very vivid memory for me. As I understand it, Cliff Dawson's store in Severna Park was like that. It was a combination pharmacy and soda fountain. I'm sure. And where was that in front of it's, it's, It was, as I understand it, it was uh, on the site of the present Dawson's Liquors. Okay. Right in the center of old Severna Park. And there, there are people around who remember Cliff Dawson's very well. We'll have to look at that. Yeah, you know, one thing um, last year, uh, 
Rick and I, we applied for a non-capital grant um, through the Lost Towns Project to, um, it's a non-capital grant with the Maryland Historical Trust to study um, and document general store buildings in the county. Um, unfortunately, we weren't awarded the grant this go around, but we're going to try again. We're going to try um, again. Because as you can see with the presentation, I mean, there were a number of them and, you know, even buildings, you know, that were repurposed, they still might be standing. So I, I'm curious how many are, are left, you know, I, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, every time I come across one, I, you know, that kind of piques my interest even more that, you know, we should, we really do need a survey of, of these vernacular building types. Um, and in addition to the ones that are left, it's it's also important and, and illuminating to find out more about the ones that are not left, because even if they're gone, uh, to get documentation, uh, to understand uh, what used to be, gives us a better understanding of the overall context, not least of all to assess the rarity of what remains. Uh, we need to get out there and, and find out as much as we can about these buildings in Anne Arundel County. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And, and so many of them too, one of the things, you know, I was, I don't know if I was surprised to learn, but so many of them have an immigrant connection. You know, once people migrated here, a lot of German immigrants um, in the county owned or operated the store or were postmasters. Um, so I'd like to look into that connection as well. Yes, that's um, very interesting. Yeah, I don't know if, well, no, Corwalls didn't have any. Well, the Corwall family hailed from Ireland. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, there's all different. And then two others, like you said, during segregation, um, you know, that were not segregated, that were welcoming, or ones that were specifically in African-American communities. I, I would love to learn more about that as well. Again, the Upshop um, in Lothian is one that we came across during um, another grant project we did on African-American heritage within the um, county's um, well, it was called the Four Rivers Heritage Area then, now it's the Chesapeake Crossroads Heritage Area. Um, but that was one that we learned about during that project. So again, if there's any others, I would love to learn more. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I can, I don't know if I can put my, uh, Drew, would you mind putting my email in the chat? please. And then if people have information they'd like to share, they can email me directly. Thank you. Um, yeah. So does anybody else have any other stories or information they want to share? Hey, Darian, it's Monica. Oh, I hi. work with you. Yes. Hi. <laughs> um, I currently live in Linthicum Heights um, in a historic pro at a historic property. But my family um, has been around for a long time. I am my maiden name is Kid, um, so Captain Kid's Liquors is in Deal, still there. I don't know if that would count as a general store, but if you live in South County, that's an important store. Yeah. <laughs> um, but grew up in Galesville. My um, mother's maiden name is Smith, so there was Smith Brothers um, Marine Construction that helped take care of the Emma Giles when it was coming and going from Galesville. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, and so all those, and my husband was born and raised on Sudley Road. So mm -hmm. there's a lot going on in this county and it's amazing the amount of research that um, you have done and that the gentleman that's with you has taken care of. It's very impressive. And oh, to have you. been here for all these years, I mean, since the early, you know, 1900s and I still learn stuff coming to work. I love yeah. it. You know, and that was, again, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this because these, you know, these buildings, they're unassuming. You're not, you know, they're not like grand old colonial building. So you just drive past them and you might not notice them, you know, or like I said, if they're not a store now, still they could be vacant. Um, and so again, bring the recognition to the people who live here um, to get an appreciation for them and, and the importance that they had in these communities. You know, people relied on them um, for many different things. So that was one of my goals here today is to just, you know, get the history out there for people. And then as you drive by, you know, keep an eye out <laughs> for them or, or for others. 
So thanks, Monica. I might talk to you more later about <laughs> Kalesville and, and deal property. I talk all day long, so it's always <laughs> good to have a topic. <laughs> Great. Well, there's a tremendous <laughs> amount of potential interest mm -hmm. uh, in, in local history. Um, well, tremendous potential amount of interest in history of any kind, but um, as I happen to uh, tell neighbors and, and people around Pasadena and Severna Park what, what I'm up to, uh, their faces just light up. Uh, you know, oh, I know that place. I've often wondered about it. So you're really going to fix it up and make it look the way it did. They like it. Um, for yeah. good reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was meeting with Rick one day and, and Marty Reese, who's the um, property owner at Corwell, it's just some lady was driving by and she That's pulled in. Right. Yeah, she pulled in and said, you know, was wondering what was happening because she remembers it as a kid. And um, she was thrilled to hear that, um, you know, Marty's plans for wanting to restore it and, and open it again. She had fond memories of it. So, yeah, you never know. I forgot that. That's yeah. absolutely right. So, yeah, I, I think at this project, like I said, it could set a precedent and maybe for others, maybe for other owners of these buildings, you know, these rundown store buildings, they might be encouraged um, to restore their buildings and use them again. You know, that's what we can hope. I'm curious uh, about the uh, the older Johnson's on mm -hmm. Mountain Road, the circa 1850. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Do you know who owns that now? I'd have to look. I, I could find out. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Something should be done about that. Yeah, like I said, it, there was a fire. fire yeah, on the inside, you can see the fire damage and it's been boarded up. Um, there had been talks because SHA, you know, they have a road widening Mountain Road project. And if that happened, then the store would have to be either relocated or, or demolished. And right now, because of its condition with all the fire damage, I don't know how structurally sound it is, but um, yeah, you drive by then, you have no idea of what it used to be. I didn't until I, I saw yeah. your research. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if someone could buy that. There had been interest um, in years past. Um, I talked to some people who were interested about possibly relocating it to save it yes. and restore it. Um, well, that should be done. No but I, I haven't heard anything since. So I don't know. But it's still there. I just hope no one drives into it because it's really like right almost on the road. So yes, <laughs> you can just see that happening. But um, hopefully it doesn't. So does anyone else want to say anything or? Is that it? Um, like I said, we recorded this and hopefully we can post it um, on the county's website. So if you know anyone who would be interested or they would have information to share with us, um, uh, you can have them email me and, and look on our website for this presentation as well. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Thanks. Mary, and great job. Thanks, Debbie.